Black Dahlia. Episode 3. The Missing Week. Officially, Elizabeth Short was never seen after the night of January 9, 1947, when she was seen leaving the Biltmore Hotel through the Olive Street exit. However, a number of witnesses, some who knew Beth or at least were acquainted with her, and even a police officer, claimed to have seen her after the last verified witness at the Biltmore. Police investigators claim all witness accounts after the Biltmore on January 9 and the time her body was discovered on January 15 were investigated and the witnesses were mistaken. However, for one reason or another, whether through incompetence or cover-up, the murder of Elizabeth Short, as well as the murders of an alarming number of victims, went unsolved in the Los Angeles area before and after the discovery of Beth's body on January 15, 1947. We will look at these murders in an upcoming episode. But for now, we will examine the testimonies of the missing weak witnesses, leaving it up to the viewers to come to their own conclusions as to whether any or all accounts bear further scrutiny. January 10, 1947 The Location The Taboo Club The Witness Christina Salisbury, also known as Princess Whitewing, former vaudeville performer and owner of a Miami Beach restaurant where Beth worked during one of her winters in Florida. Salisbury claimed she saw Beth in the company of two women, a blonde and a brunette, at the Taboo Club on Sunset Strip. Salisbury said she talked to Elizabeth, who told her she was staying with the two women at a San Fernando Valley motel. She described the first woman as a tall blonde, about 30 years old, and weighing about 160 pounds. The second woman had very dark hair and very heavy makeup, and was about 27 years old. This sighting is notable because Salisbury knew Beth for some time as an employee, and spoke with her during the sighting. January 10, 1947 The Location The Four Star Grill on Sunset Strip The Witness Buddy Lagore Bartender at the Four Star Grill on Hollywood Boulevard where he knew Beth as a frequent customer. Lagore claimed he saw Beth accompanied by two women. Lagore said, When she came in that last time, she looked as if she'd slept in her clothes for days. The sheer black dress was stained and crumpled. I'd seen her many times before and always she wore the best nylons. But this time she had no stockings on. She always dressed immaculately, and her clothing makeup and hair were perfect. But this time he commented that her hair was straggly, her lipstick looked to have been applied in a hit-or-miss fashion, and he described her makeup looking as if the powder was caked on her face. He also commented that Beth's demeanor was cowed instead of being gay and excited, the way I'd seen her before. Another thing to remember and consider is that Beth was not a drinker, and when she did drink, it was only light social drinking, and even then rarely. Lagore explained. It was her custom to order soft drinks. Lagore added something else that seemed out of character, at least to how he knew her. Beth was usually described as being nice and polite, but not to Lagore. She was friendly and nice to me this time. The other times I saw her, she acted like the grand lady and was bossy. The thing I find most interesting about Lagore's testimony was his statement about her nylons. If he knew Beth well enough to know the quality of her nylons, and then noticed that on January 10 that she wore no nylons, then he must have recognized the real Elizabeth Short. Add to that that, that he waited on her and noted her change in attitude toward him, and I'd say his account is about as definitive as you can get. January 9th or 10th, 1947 the location. Chancellor Apartments. The witness. Iris Menuet, who knew Beth from apartment 501 at the Chancellor. Menuet said she saw Beth in the Chancellor lobby at around 8.30 p.m. embracing a man dressed like a gas station attendant. Menuet stated her sighting happened on the 9th or 10th, but it must have been the 10th. It has already been established that Beth was in the lobby of the Biltmore Hotel until 10 p.m. on the 9th, when she was seen leaving through the Olive Street exit by Bell Captain Harold Studholm. January 10, 1947 The Location 
7200 block of Sunset Boulevard. The Witness. John Doe, number one. He said he saw Beth with two women in a black coupe on the 7200 block of Sunset Boulevard. He overheard a bit of their conversation, stating they were staying in a motel on Ventura Boulevard and were going to the Flamingo Club on La Brea Avenue. He described the two women as, the first being about 27 years old, 5 feet 6 inches tall, 125 pounds, with long black hair. The second being in her 20s, with light brown, combed up hair. January 11, 1947 The Location Chancellor Hotel The Witness Paul Simone, Hotel Employee Simone claimed to have heard loud arguing and went to investigate. He found a woman he identified as Elizabeth Short arguing with a woman who was cursing loudly at Elizabeth. The argument was getting so heated that he thought things would get physical. The woman yelled. Oh nuts to you. At Simone when he tried to calm things down. And then, she left the building. The woman he identified as Short asked him. Is there a rear exit to the hotel? He then escorted her out the front to a taxi. One thing strange about Simone's account is that Beth had lived in apartment 501 at the Chancellor and should have known if there was a public rear exit to the hotel. January 11, 1947 The Location Outside the Rosslyn Hotel at 6th and Main Streets The Witness I.A. Jorgensen, Cab Driver Jorgensen claimed that a man and a woman he later identified as Elizabeth Short entered his cab parked outside the Rosslyn Hotel. He then drove them to a Hollywood motel, the name of which and description of the man was withheld by police pending a follow-up and interview of employees at the motel in Hollywood. January 11, 1947 The Location Beverly Hills Hotel Station The Witness John Doe No. 2, Gas Station Attendant Name withheld by police A gas station attendant working at the Beverly Hills Hotel Station said he saw Elizabeth Short in the Beverly Hills area around 2.30 a.m. What he identified as a 1942 Chrysler Coupe stopped at the gas station. As he fueled the car, he noticed a woman he later identified as Elizabeth Short in the back seat. He said she seemed very upset and frightened, and added that another woman was in the car who was wearing dark clothing. He said the driver was about 30 years old, 6 foot 1, and weighed around 190 pounds. Iris Menue claimed to have seen Beth embracing a man dressed like a gas station attendant in the lobby of the Chancellor on January 10. Coincidence or same guy? There had to be some reason why police withheld his identity. January 11, 1947 The Location The 6024 Carlos Avenue residence of Mark Hansen The Witnesses And Toth, Connie Starr, Mark Hansen Although I can find no statement by Mark Hansen saying he saw Elizabeth Short on that date, and Toth and Connie Starr would both state that they saw her during a dinner at Mark Hansen's bungalow and that he was present. Taken from an interview with Connie Starr by Lt. Frank Jemison on January 26, 1950. And Toth invited Connie Starr to dinner on Saturday, January 11, 1947. They dined with Mark Hansen at his 6024 Carlos Avenue residence. At around 9 p.m., Starr said, Beth and her boyfriend, a young kid with brown hair arrived. Two days later, on January 28, 1950, Lieutenant Jemison and Detective Finus Brown followed up on Connie Starr's statement by interviewing in Toth, who corroborated Starr's account. Lieutenant Jemison questioned Toth. Do you recall a time when at Mark Hansen's house, there, when Betty came in after you had dinner, with some young fellow, you had company there and she was dressed in a pink dress and she was cold, it was rather cool and chilly, and Mark got a blanket to put around her and heavy socks to put on? I do remember that. And Toth did not know the name of Beth's date. However, she did confirm the details of Mark Hansen's interactions with Beth at the time. 
Mark got a blanket to put around her and heavy socks for her to put on. January 12, 1947 The Location The Dugout Café, 634 South Main Street, Downtown Los Angeles The Witness C.G. Williams Bartender at the Dugout Williams said that during the afternoon, a woman he later identified as Elizabeth Short entered the bar with someone described as an attractive blonde. Like Buddy Lagore, Williams knew Beth as a regular customer. Williams said a fracas occurred when two men tried to pick the women but were rejected. January 12, 1947 The Location The Gateway Bar 514 South Main Street The Witness Betty Blake. Dancer at the bar. Blake stated that a red-haired man came into the bar looking for Beth, who had been seen in the bar by Blake earlier in the evening. January 12, 1947. The Location. Hirsch Apartments. East Washington Boulevard. The Witnesses. Mr. and Mrs. Johnson. Hirsch Owners. The Johnsons claimed a woman matching Beth's description checked in with a man they later identified from a photo found in Beth's trunk. This man, described with medium height and complexion, signed the register as, Barnes and wife. Mr. Barnes claimed he and his wife were moving out of Hollywood. Although the Johnsons did not see Mrs. Barnes again and it was some time before they saw Mr. Barnes, Mr. Barnes finally returned on another day. Mr. Johnson joked that he thought Barnes might be dead. Evidently, Barnes did not see the humor. He got angry and left. Note. This account is largely discredited. Police dusted the room that the Barnes had rented and found no fingerprints matching Beth's. Also, Mrs. Johnson described Barnes' wife as having black hair. At this time it is known that Beth hennaed her hair red before leaving the French house in San Diego. They were also mistaken about identifying the man in the photograph as Mr. Barnes. The man, sometimes identified as Mr. Barnes and sometimes Ed Burns, a dubious suspect from a website claiming to have solved the Black Dahlia murder, which will be discussed briefly in a future episode, was in reality a man named George Maine. Identified by Black Dahlia researcher Steve Hodell in his book Black Dahlia Avenger as Gerald Moss to protect his identity. George Maine lived in Indianapolis, Indiana and was the man seen in the well-known photos of Beth with a man taken in a photo booth. The photos were taken in Indianapolis in 1946 when Beth was on her way west. January 13, 1947 The Location Corner of Hollywood Boulevard and Highland Avenue. The Witness. John Juridek. Former jockey and GI stationed at Camp Cook at the time Beth worked there. Juridek, who remembered Beth from when she worked at the PX at Camp Cook, said he saw her at the corner of Hollywood Boulevard and Highland Avenue when she was the passenger in a 1937 Ford sedan driven by a blonde female. He spoke to Beth when it was stopped at the intersection. January 14, 1947. The Location. The Main Street Bar. The Witness. Policewoman Merle McBride. A crying woman approached Officer McBride saying, Someone wants to kill me. She told Officer McBride that an ex-Marine former boyfriend threatened her in the Main Street Bar, stating that he would kill her if he found her with another man. Officer McBride escorted the woman back to the bar so that she could get her purse. Soon after, McBride stated that she saw the woman re-enter the bar, and then emerge with two men and a woman. McBride approached the woman, who now told her she was going to meet her parents at the bus station later in the evening. After the body of Jane Doe No. 1 was positively identified as Elizabeth Short on January 16, 1947, Officer McBride positively identified Beth as the woman who had approached her on the 14th. Soon after, McBride's statement of positive identification was modified to being uncertain. 
One thing I find strange about this account is why would Officer McBride let a woman who was complaining and terrified about her life being threatened go without at least taking down the girl's name, address, name of man threatening her, etc., and then later file a report. Even if later, when the woman left with others to supposedly meet her parents, and all seemed well, McBride still should have at least noted what happened. Or did she take down more details only to have them suppressed? It would be less than a day before Beth's remains would be found and perhaps only several hours before the time of her death as estimated in the autopsy done by Dr. Frederick Newbar. Why would McBride change her story? Had she really been mistaken, or did her superiors tell her she was mistaken? If McBride's statement had been changed for her, why was it changed? No description of the two men and a woman seen with the possible Beth was released, at least that I could find. But these individuals would be some of the last people, if not the last people, to see her alive. It is possible that these people killed her or took her to the person or persons who did. It is too early to discuss conspiracies or cover-ups now. Let us first look into the investigation and what is known before we go deeper into theory and speculation. We will look at Black Dahlia conspiracy theories and possible police cover-ups in another episode. Even if some of these accounts are wrong, and yes, it is most likely that some are, there are far too many accounts of people who knew Beth seeing her during this so-called missing week. As we saw in the Toth, star sighting on January 11th, Lieutenant Jemison and Detective Brown were still taking statements about Beth's whereabouts during the missing week in 1950. There are three possibilities why the murder of the Black Dahlia was never solved. 1. Incompetence. 2. Deliberate obfuscation and cover-up due to conspiracy. 3. Sometimes, even when investigators do everything they can, the bad guys just get away with murder. Missing Week Commonalities of Witness Accounts These are the 13 most well-known witness accounts of Elizabeth Short sightings during the so-called Missing Week. Out of these 13 accounts are 16 individuals claiming to have seen her. Seven witnesses knew Beth. Six witnesses claimed to have definitely talked to her. Six others possibly talked to her due to their work or had been in a position or proximity to do so. Fourteen witnesses saw her with others. One witness who had seen her said that later an individual came in looking for her. Three witnesses saw her in a vehicle. One of those vehicles matched a witness description of seeing a 1936 or 1937 Ford sedan at the body dump site. One witness saw Beth in the presence of two men and a woman. Beth was seen frightened and complained that someone was going to kill her soon before the witness saw her with the mysterious trio. Two men and a woman tracked Beth to the French residence in San Diego only days earlier. The Frenches said Beth was frightened of the mysterious trio and refused to answer the door. Were the trios the same people in both cases? In two separate instances, a blonde woman was driving the car in which Beth was a passenger. In another two instances, Beth was seen with two women. Two of these women were described as having long black hair. In one case a woman was described as blonde and in the other case with light brown hair. However, under differing lighting conditions, it would be possible for a blonde to be described as having light brown hair or vice versa. In two other cases, she was seen with a blonde. It seems that during this so-called missing week, and even a couple days prior to it in San Diego, Beth really got around, and even hung out with similarly described people and groups of people. There are other considerations during the missing week that need mentioning. Where was Beth getting her clothes during the missing week? And Toth stated that Beth did not like borrowing clothes. Toth said. She was the type that didn't want anybody to touch their clothes and she didn't want to touch theirs. She washed everything. She was a very meticulous person. Toth confirmed this in greater detail when she told about the incident described in a previous episode that finally caused Mark Hansen to throw Beth out, when Beth and one of Hansen's new girlfriends got into a fight when Beth believed the girl was going to break into her suitcase. However,
Toth also mentions something that happened during the missing week that shows Beth was acting out of character about her fastidiousness. She claimed that when Beth dropped by the Hansen house, Beth was cold, and Hansen fetched her a blanket and socks to wear. This suggests that Beth was not her normal self during the missing week. If Beth didn't usually wear other women's dresses, etc., then wearing another person's socks should have been out of the question. Was this a cry for help, asking someone who knew her sensitivities to strangers' clothes to provide her with strangers' clothes? Both Hansen and Toth knew Beth hated wearing strangers' clothes. It had been the recent catalyst that had made Hansen throw Beth out. So where was Beth getting her clothes? Buddy Legor stated Beth's dress was stained and crumpled. He said she looked as if she had slept in her clothes for days. This was on January 10th, only the day after she was seen leaving the Biltmore, and they were not the clothes that Red Manley had described her as wearing when he left her there. Legor also said her hair and makeup were unkempt, and she wasn't wearing nylons. If you buy into the missing week, what had she gotten herself into? What kind of people had their hands on her and what were they doing or planning on doing with her? Was murder always their goal? Or did Beth do something that caused someone or all of them to cross the line? Why was she still dating? Toth and Starr both stated that Beth had brought a young, brown-haired boyfriend to Mark Hansen's house. Was it a date at all? Or was this young, brown-haired man her captor, or one of her captors? If people planned on killing her, they were sure parading her around in front of possibly hundreds of witnesses, including many who knew her. The missing week is just another of the many riddles surrounding the enigma that is the Black Dahlia case. I think there were just too many witnesses, and too many who knew Beth and spoke to her, to make it a series of mistaken identities.